I've learned a lot about Home Assistant in the last five years of using it. I was reflecting on this just the other week as I was putting a video together about my favourite home automations. I actually use quite a few different techniques now than when I first started out. Some of these techniques make sure that my automations fail less often, some of them have helped me reduce the number of automations that I need to do the same thing, and some of them I just find kind of cool. I thought I'd share some of them with you in this video, maybe you'll learn something. If you have any techniques that you use that I've not covered, why not share them in the comments so that we can all learn? Either way, let's take a look. The best way to show you these techniques is to create some example automations. These examples aren't always the way that I make my automations, they're just designed to highlight the techniques I want to explain. If you want to know how I actually make my automations, then you should definitely check out the other videos on my channel. Home Assistant automations have three main components. There's the trigger, or the when as it's now called, which is what makes the automation start up and do its thing. Next we have the conditions, or the and if which is sort of a failsafe or check to make sure you really want that automation to run, and I'll give you an example of that in a second. Then finally, we have the actions that will be run by Home Assistant for that automation, now called the then do. Let's consider an example, turning on a light if motion is detected. We would want this automation to be triggered when motion is detected by a motion sensor, so we add that to the trigger part at the top. But perhaps we only want the light to turn on if it's nighttime, so we can add a condition to the and if part to check if it's after sunset. So if motion is detected and it's nighttime, we then want the light to turn on, so we add that as an action to the then do section like this. And let's give it a 5 second transition, because transitions are cool. That is how all Home Assistant automations are structured, but I'm guessing you probably already knew that. These automations can become more and more complex by adding more and more parts to any of these three sections. Let's imagine that you also want to turn on a switch when someone enters the room. This is what I do in my office automations to make sure that our desks and monitors power up when someone enters the room. The rest of the time they are powered off to save energy. You can easily just add another action underneath the one that turns on the light to turn on the desk power switch. Home Assistant will then run this automation and perform each action in the list, one after the other, until the automation's finished. That's exactly how I used to create my automations, and it worked fine 99% of the time. That was until one of the actions failed. If that happened, then the automation would stop, and not run any of the subsequent actions. Imagine that in this automation there was something wrong with my office lights, so this step fails. Because of the way I've structured the automation, not only does the light not turn on, but the desk power also doesn't turn on because the automation never makes it to that step. I then learned about this option to run actions in parallel, which meant it would run multiple things at once, and if any of them failed to run, it wouldn't affect the other actions. You can pretty easily add this to your existing automations, and thanks to the Home Assistant handy drag and drop functionality, you can just drag your existing actions right here into the run parallel section. Using this technique I've been able to make my automations way more reliable. Sure, things still fail from time to time, but only one small part of an automation stops working, rather than the whole thing. Pretty neat, huh? So let's extend this automation a bit more. At the moment, this automation only turns on the lights and powers my desk up if I walk into the office after sunset. It doesn't do anything at all during the day because of the and if condition. You can imagine a world where I would want my desk to always power up when motion is detected but only want the lights to come on if it's after sunset. Of course we could create two automations here, one with a condition for the lights, and one that has no condition and always turns on the desk power. Or we can keep our office automations consolidated and simply move the sunset condition to apply only to the lights action. You can use an if then action to only run certain actions if a condition is met and then we can drag our and if condition out of the main part of the automation and into the if part of this block. Simple, huh? You can then drag the light turn on action into the then part of the block. This automation will now always turn on the desk power when motion is detected, but only turn the light on if it's after sunset. When I'm using an if section like this, I like to rename the section to something that explains what it does. This makes it a lot easier for me to see what this automation is doing when the sections are collapsed. Right, 
What if we want the lights in the desk to turn off again when motion or presence stops being detected? Again, we could create a second automation for this that turns off everything when the motion sensor stops detecting motion, but we want to keep things consolidated. So instead, we'll add another action called a wait for trigger action. This waits until a sensor or anything else switches to another state. In this case, we want to wait for the office motion sensor to stop detecting presence. Then, underneath that, we can create another run in parallel action to turn off the ceiling lights and the desk power switch. This does make the automation a lot more complex, but again, keeps it all consolidated in one place. I usually use this wait for trigger type automation in places where I know the lights won't be on for a long period of time, such as my bathroom or laundry light automations, as I don't spend hours and hours in there. For the automations in my office, I personally stick to two automations, one to turn things on and another to turn things off. It just gives me a bit more flexibility and control. But there are other times where I keep a single automation with two different triggers, and then I use trigger IDs to figure out which one of them triggered the automation. I'll show you what I mean. Imagine this same office automation that we had before, triggered when the motion sensor detects presence. We can add another trigger here that activates when the same motion sensor stops detecting presence. You can now give each of these triggers a different trigger ID, and we can use this later in the automation to figure out if the automation was triggered because motion was detected or because the motion cleared. Back down in the actions area, we can now add a choose action, which lets us choose a path to take through the automation based on what triggered it. For the first option, add a new condition and search for the triggered by condition. You should now be able to tick the box next to the trigger that you want to create these actions for, in this case, the turn on actions. You can then drag the existing actions down into the new actions area inside the choose block. Wait, what the fuck? Where did they go? I think I just found a home assistant bug. I should go and report that. Anyway, imagine that it worked as expected and you should now see the actions you had before in the right place, and they will be run when the motion sensor detects motion. At this point, I like to rename the parallel block and give it a more descriptive title, so that I know what it does when I collapse it down. Now we can do all of this all over again by adding another option for the actions we want to take when the motion sensor stops detecting presence. We again select the triggered by condition, and this time tick the other box. Then we'll run a couple more actions in parallel to turn off the desk power and the lights, and rename the block so that we can easily understand what the automation is doing later. This gives us a single automation with two triggers and a choose action that runs the correct automation steps based on whatever triggered the automation. Cool, huh? I use this a fair bit in my smart home. One example is the automation that turns on the lights in my garden when the back door is opened, and turns them off again five minutes after the door is closed. You might be wondering how I make it wait a few minutes after the door is closed before the lights turn off. Well, for that I use the duration section of the automation trigger. I set this to 5 minutes for the door close trigger, which means that it will only trigger this part of the automation when the door has been closed for 5 minutes. If I close the door for a minute and then open it up again, it won't turn off the light. I often get asked when people see these complex automations why I don't use something like Node Red instead. Node Red lets you visually create automations using a flowchart style drag and drop interface, and honestly, it looks pretty cool. I have absolutely nothing against it, I've just personally never tried it. Maybe it's because I have a programming or technical background, but I find the standard Home Assistant Automation Editor to work really well for me. If you want to learn more about how Node Red works in Home Assistant, then you should definitely check out this beginner's guide video from Let's Automate. I've linked to it in the description below. Anyway, back to Home Assistant automations. The last thing that I want to mention is all of the labeling and filtering options that you can now apply to organize and categorize your automations. I have over 150 Home Assistant automations, and because most of them were created a long time ago, they have a specific naming convention which uses something like a category and then a colon and a descriptive name for the automation. Since then, the Home Assistant developers have added in all sorts of categorization options, you can label your automations with one or more labels, and you can assign them to areas. You can do all of this in the kebab menu within the automation itself. But honestly, 
I have no idea how to best take advantage of this. I've never been a very organized human, and I just tend to search using the search box at the top of the automation editor and hope for the best. Mine is an absolute mess, so I'm not even going to begin to attempt to tell you how you should organize yours. But do you use these categories and things in your Home Assistant instance? If so, please share with us how you've organized your automations in the comments below so that we can all learn from you. And please give this video a thumbs up if you've learned anything or found it useful. If you found it really useful, I would really appreciate a donation to the channel via a YouTube super thanks or a PayPal donation. The link to that is in the description below. And if you don't want to donate, I completely understand. But please consider subscribing to the channel if you're a fan of Home Assistant. I regularly release videos like this about smart homes, automations, and Home Assistant in general. By subscribing to the channel, you'll know when I've released a new video, and then together we can make your home smarter.